welcome. But be forewarned, a few scenes in this hour are disturbing because we're dealing with violence and don't want to hide what is true about it. As you know, one year ago this weekend, 20 school children and six educators were massacred at the Sandy Hook Elementary School. The killer also murdered his mother and then killed himself, 28 deaths in all from guns. Across America, perhaps as many as 30,000 more have been killed since that fatal day. This is why I've asked Richard Slotkin to join me. He has spent his adult life delving into how violence took deep root in our culture from colonial days to now. In his magisterial trilogy, Regeneration Through Violence, The Fatal Environment, and Gunfighter Nation, Richard Slotkin tells how America came to embrace a mythology of gunslinging settlers taming the wilderness to justify and romanticize a tragic record of subjugation and bloodshed. His latest book, The Long Road to Antietam, tells the story of the bloodiest day in American history. In these and other works, this preeminent cultural historian tracks the evolution of the gun culture that continues to dominate, wound, and kill. Richard Slotkin has retired now from a distinguished teaching career of over four decades at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, just 45 minutes from Newtown. Welcome. Thank you. What were you thinking as the first anniversary of the massacre approached? Uh, well, I was, I was thinking of the sadness of that day and just the, 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 the idea of all those, as one woman at the town said, those poor little babies uh, being slaughtered. And I was also uh, remembering with some uh, anger uh, the way in which uh, one of the first knee-jerk responses to, the, uh, to that event was a, uh, a kind of rabid defense of uh, uh, not only defense of gun owning, but a, a kind of plea for extending uh, the privilege of gun ownership and uh, the number of occasions, the type of occasions on which guns could be used. And not only that, the, the different places that one can carry guns, and also the number of situations in which it's permissible to pull out your gun and, and shoot somebody. I'm thinking about stand your ground laws, mm -hmm. so-called. When one of these massacres occurs, do you automatically or just habitually think about this long train of violence that you've been researching and writing about for so long now? Well. Uh, thinking about this Adam Lanza case, the, the killer in, um, in Newtown, at first it just seemed to me uh, a, a, crazy, a crazy kid doing something almost inexplicably crazy with, uh, with a gun. Uh, as the report has come out. Um, the state report the, the recently sta yes, came the, out a couple of weeks ago. Right? Yeah, the, the state report has uh, gone into the way in which he used video games and obsessively played uh, violent video games uh, and apparently did research on massacres. And there's a way in which, um, uh, in the individual case, you see something that also works on the, the cultural level, and that is that people will model their behavior on examples that they consider to be heroic. And that's how, that's how mythology works in a, in a culture. There, there are cultural myths that define what for us is a, is a positive response to a crisis, um, and it's embodied in media and we learn it through the media, and we model our behavior on that of heroes. And apparently Lanza, uh, in, in the way he conducted the massacre, was making the kind of moves that are the standard moves of a person playing a violent video game. Uh, you'd never enter a new room unless you've put a fresh clip in your gun. So he would shoot off half a clip and then change the clip anyway, uh, because that's what you do when you're playing a video game. And that, that image of, of playing out a script mm. that's been written for you, that has some value for you as a, a way of gaining control or of being a hero, he is, is what, he's, what he's living out. And, and what Lanza did was really to indoctrinate himself mm. uh, in, uh, and train himself in a way analogous to the way we now use video games to train uh, the military. Talk about that a moment. Train himself? Yes, uh, that, is, that is he's obsessed with, with uh, performing some, act, some validating act of violence. And he does these, he t treats these video games as training films. I could do it this way, I could do it that way. Uh, and as I follow out the script of the video game, the video game validates my actions in various ways. You, you triumph within a narrative or you simply score points and, 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 uh, and build up a score. 
there is a video game, believe it or not. It's, it's violent, I warn you, it's violent. It allows you, the viewer, to follow the killer of Lieutenant, to follow yes, Anza, and I actually have. shoot the kids in front of you. You are a cultural historian, not a behavioral psychologist, yes. not a weapons expert. What do you suppose the producer of that video had in mind? I just simply exploiting uh, the appeal of violence in a particular kind of situation. And also, in, in this case, I, there's an appeal of transgression. Of, uh, transgression? Uh, yes, of, of violating everybody else's norms and doing something that really grosses everybody out. Uh, uh, you, you think even uh, to, to take a more normative example, uh, the video game Grand Theft Auto, in which you behave like a criminal. You'd think in a kind of standard uh, video game, you'd be the hero against the bad guys. But that the appeal of that is that you get to go to the dark side, as to use the language of Star Wars. And the dark side of the Force always has its appeal. The graphics put you in a very realistic situation so that you're the killer. Um, it's an imaginative leap that, in my generation, uh, it took a little more difficulty to make that connection. But we made it, nonetheless. I grew up with Western movies. So did I. And uh, the, I'll, I'll say John Wayne. He wasn't necessarily my hero, but he's the type of the kind of, of uh, hero that I, uh, that I admired. And we played guns in the street. Uh, you'd start off guns where you were cowboys, you'd segue without a break into marines, and you'd segue into cops and robbers. Uh, but the gun was the, was the thing you were playing with. And yet so many who would do that never went out like Adam Lanza no. and started killing. That's, that's why that's right. people are reluctant to say this causes that. Yes. Just to, to extend my example a little bit. Um, uh, one of the syndromes that uh, uh, people working with uh, Vietnam veterans suffering from PTSD was something called John Wayne syndrome, mm. where the young men had internalized the John Wayne model of heroism, and one of their problems was they, they, they felt they had failed somehow to live up to that model. And that, that's the psychology we're talking about here. You internalize a model of heroic behavior from the media that purvey the myths that shape uh, your society. And uh, you, there's a whole spectrum of responses you might have in relation to that internalized model. You, you might not do anything right. yourself. You might simply consent that uh, the government or somebody act on your behalf. Make, you don't make the war yourself, but you consent that somebody make the war for you, kill the bad guy for you. The report also says he used uh, spreadsheets to chronicle previous mass shootings and collected articles all the way back to 1891 about school shootings. Yes. Yeah, it, it's, it, his imagination is, is horribly fascinating in a way because he's reaching for a historic, not, not just, he's not just reaching for a model, he's reaching for a historically validated model that will somehow invest what he's doing with meaning. What the meaning is, is, is gone with him, but, but the gestures seem to, point, to me to point to that. So, so put it historically, what this tells us about the lone killer. We produce the lone killer. That is to say, the lone killer is trying to validate himself or herself uh, in, in, in terms of the um, I would say, call him the historical mythology uh, of our society, he wants to place himself in relation to meaningful events in the past that lead up to a, lead, lead to the present. You say, or her, but the fact of the matter is all these killers yeah. lately have been males. Yeah. Yes, yeah, pretty much always are. And yeah. most of them why? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Again, this is because, because each case is different, but the, the tendency that you've pointed out is true, and, and I've always felt that it has something to do, in many cases, with a sense of lost privilege, mm -hmm. that men uh, and white men in the society feel their, their position to be imperiled uh, and uh, uh, their, their, uh, their status called into question. 
And uh, one way to deal with uh, an attack on your status in our society is to strike out violently. I guess we'll never understand this. That official report laid out Lanza's troubling behavior. He was diagnosed at six with sensory integration disorder. He couldn't stand to be touched. He had Asperger's syndrome. He closeted himself in his bedroom with his windows sealed yeah. by black plastic bags. Um, he, didn't, he, he didn't want to communicate with his mother except mostly through emails. I mean, what, does, what do we take away from this? No, knowing we'll never know. I, I think the thing that, that, that I'm tempted to do with that is to shift away from the unknowable Adam Lanza to the people around Adam Lanza and, and his mother, um, that here you have an obviously disturbed young man. Everybody sees it. His mother sees it. And the one way of dealing with it is to buy him guns mm. uh, as presents, uh, buy him uh, fairly exotic, uh, well-chosen models, train him in the use of uh, apparently this elaborate arsenal uh, which his mother had. And she, as she said, she loved her guns um, and never made the connection to the fact that these guns are in, uh, available to an extremely troubled young man. And uh, the neighbors never questioned that her love of guns might be putting weapons in the hands of somebody that they found disturbing to deal with. And to me, that speaks of um, uh, our mystique of weapons. Uh, perhaps his mother thought the gun was curative in some way. We have a, uh, the, the, the gun as the symbol of productive violence in our history uh, has m magical properties for a lot of people. And uh, I have, have this horrible feeling something like that prevented anyone from seeing just how desperately dangerous it was, was the situation in which these people were living. Yeah, it's almost incomprehensible that when the police went into the Lanza home after the massacre, they, they, they found this, uh, this gift she had left for him, a check yes. that was to be uh, dated the 25th of December, Christmas, and it was to be used by him to buy a, a CZ-83 yeah. pistol. Yeah. She must have thought that the gun would do him good. Richard, you live close to Newtown, and you follow this, of course, not only because as a citizen, but because of your history, your work in history. What, was the, what did you see about the reaction of the community in the, in, in the days and weeks following that, 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 that affected you? The thing that really got to me most was the strength of the pro-gun reaction that came out almost immediately, uh, that anticipating that, of course, there'd be some uh, call for some forms of gun regulation or gun control. Uh, that the, uh, the, the, the self, the, there was a kind of a preemptive attack on that by a range of organizations within the state. Um, uh, no, it's, you know, gun control won't do any good. And um, within a, a couple of weeks, I was on a panel discussion in which there were uh, four people who, were, who, were, who had been typecast as anti-gun, uh, which I'm not really, uh, and, um, uh, the pro-gun people, as if there were, there was, it was a 50-50 balance. And of course, the gun, pro-gun people kind of took over the whole thing because it was a, a bad moderator. And so you got, the, you got the impression that the state was sharply divided. When the governor came out with a program of increased regulations, um, the majority was so overwhelmingly for it that the bill passed. Uh, I remember uh, that. And, and uh, without, without any back and forth, really, about it. So that it turned out that they weren't even uh, a, a large minority, but they were a minority minority within the state. And yet, rhetorically, their presence was very powerful. And the arguments that they were making were the kind of arguments that resonate with our love of liberty and, uh, and so on. They really, in, to, to just take this terrible incident and this uh, some, uh, and a situation which might lend itself to some sane regulation and just blow it up into, uh, uh, into a life or death of the republic kind of issue, which makes it almost impossible to deal with. You said you were not anti-gun. No, I'm not. There, there are situations in which it is perfectly reasonable for someone to want to own and use a gun. Hunting, 
is, is, a, is a legitimate and respected and necessary aspect of the, the ecology. Um, there are many people in many places, many different kinds of places, rural, far from police, where it makes perfect sense to want to own a weapon for self-defense. Um, so I can't say I'm, I'm against guns, but uh, then when you go beyond the rational, uh, it, it gets a little crazy. Why wouldn't you want, if you're, if you're a, a legitimate gun owner, why wouldn't you want gun ownership to be regulated in such a way that to the extent feasible, criminals, insane persons could not readily gain access. Why wouldn't you want a, a, a prohibition on gun tra illegal gun trafficking if, you're in, if your guns are legal and it's a, it's a legal sale? Why wouldn't you want rules mandating some program of safe storage of weapons so that people who are, can't be as careless as Mrs. Lanza seemingly was in leaving guns around where crazy people and criminals can get their hands on it. Um, that's where the, where the rule of reason has to enter in, and that's where it doesn't enter in. There was a surge of sanity uh, on the part of politicians again after uh, Newtown. Truth be told, and as we all know, very little has changed. Yes. How do you explain that? Well, I think th the extreme gun rights position, so-called, someone once called it gundamentalism, um, uh, connects on a kind of spectrum to more normative attitudes. You, you have, as I said, reasonable gun owners. Then you have the American consumer. The American consumer looks at the gun as a, it's, a, it's a piece of property. The American consumer wants to use his property without restraint, wants to, 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 to throw his, his uh, plastic water bottle wherever, wherever he pleases, want to drive a gas guzzler, uh, want to play his boom box uh, uh, yeah. loud. Um, which is crude, a crude way to put it, and yet I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot to that. Nobody wants to be bothered registering their weapons. Um, uh, take it a level down from that, or, or sort of a little level further out from that, there's an ideological level, which um, really kicks in around the time of the, the Reagan uh, presidency, in which gun rights is, is a, a, a very powerful symbol of the de for the deregulation of everything. Mm. Uh, if you can deregulate that, you can deregulate anything. And then the, the last level is what I'd call the, 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 the paranoid level, the people who think that they have a Second Amendment right to resist Obamacare, mm. uh, that, uh, that, that the Constitution protects their right to resist the government, that that's what the Second Amendment is about. And that's, that's dangerous stupidity and nonsense. But um, it, uh, it uses the language of liberty and rights uh, uh, that we're, we're used to uh, thinking of in other contexts. And if you think of, of uh, um, all of the rights in the, in the uh, Bill of Rights, haven't they been extended and expanded over the years? Why not, why not Second Amendment rights as well? And that's, where the, that's the level at which it gets pernicious. But, the, the, but their appeal, their ability to control the debate I think comes because their, their position coincides with the interest of the, uh, the, the Reaganite ideologue who doesn't want to regulate anything and the consumer who simply doesn't want to be bothered. And don't both of those strands, both of, both of those tendencies have their roots deep in our culture going all the way back to the beginning? Well, yes. That, I mean, the, the, um, the thing that's different, that's exceptional about American gun culture, so-called, is the, the, the license that we grant for the private use of deadly force. Um, there are, there are, uh, other countries have similar levels of uh, guns in the home. Now, Switzerland is a militia state, but the, and the, homes are, the guns are kept at home. But the guns kept at home in those countries are not used to murder individuals, are not used to settle uh, property disputes. Uh, are not used to shoot somebody who comes to your door trick or treating and you're not sure uh, who they are. And, and what we have in, in this country is uh, we have a history which, in, in which certain kinds of violence are associated for us with the growth of the republic, with the definition of what it is to be an American. And because we are also devoted to the notion of democratic individualism, we take that 
glorification of social violence, historical violence, political violence, and we grant the individual a, a kind of parallel right uh, to exercise it, not only to protect life and property, but to protect one's honor mm. uh, uh, and to protect one's uh, social or racial status. Uh, in, in the past, that has been a legitimate grounds. What do you mean? Well, I'm thinking of, of uh, the Jim Crow era in the South, where um, if a black man is walking on a sidewalk and towards a white man and the black man refuses to give the sidewalk, uh, he can be, and any sort of violence can be safely visited upon him because no jury will convict. Uh, cases where uh, one, one in a, uh, another book that I wrote about a uh, uh, in, wi in which a, black, a successful black farmer refused to sell his uh, crop, this was in South Carolina, uh, for the stated price, uh, and uh, events escalated from uh, a personal attack to ultimately lynching. Uh, so, you, so we've granted to private citizens the right to, to police the racial boundary and the social boundary. You write in, in, in one of your books, in American mythogenesis, the origin of our national mythology, the founding fathers were not those 18th century gentlemen who composed a nation at Philadelphia. Rather, they were those who tore violently a nation from implacable and opulent wilderness. Talk about that. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, every nation, every nation state requires a historical mythology uh, because a nation state is a kind of political artifice. Right. It pulls diverse peoples together. And so you need a, 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 a his, a, an account of history that explains that you're actually all the same kind of person or that your different natures have been blended through experience. So what? We the people. We the people. And the United States is a settler state. That is, it begins with colonial outposts uh, in the wilderness. And our origin has a story then, has to be, how did we go from being these small outposts to being the mightiest nation? On, uh, on, on planet Earth. Well, we did it by pushing the boundaries of the settlement out into Indian country. We did it by ultimately fighting wars against Native Americans, driving them out, displacing them, exterminating them in some cases. Uh, and in the process of pushing our boundaries out, we acquired certain heroic virtues, uh, an ability to fight cleverly both as individuals and cooperatively, and a connection with nature, which is particularly critical. Um, as, you, as the country really develops, you get a, a kind of American exceptionalist notion of progress, which is that American progress is achieved not by man exploiting man, but it's achieved by conquering nature, by taking resources from nature. Uh, farmland uh, originally, uh, timber resources, Forest. ultimately gold, minerals, oil, and so on. In the American model, what, in order for it to work, you have to say that Native Americans, Indians, are not quite human. And therefore, they, they like trees in the forest, are legitimate objects of creative destruction. And similarly, blacks, uh, African Americans, are legitimate objects of exploitation because they are considered to be not fully human. So what you get uh, in this, the, the evolution of the American national myth, uh, really up through the Civil War, is uh, the creation of America as a white man's republic, in which, uh, different from Europe, if you're white, you're all right. Um, uh, you don't have to be an aristocrat born uh, to, to have a place in the society. You don't uh, absolutely even have to be Anglo-Saxon, although it helps. Um, but so, so among whites, you can have democracy. But the white democracy depends on the, the, the murder, uh, the, the extermination, the driving out of Native Americans, and the enslavement of blacks. Both of those boundaries, the Western frontier, the Indian frontier, and the slave frontier are boundaries created and enforced by violence, either literal or uh, latent, pot potential So violence. that's why you wrote, something came from this mythology, something about the land and its people, its dark people especially, 
economically exploited and wasted. The warfare between man and nature, between race and race, exalted as a kind of heroic ideal. Yes, that is the frontier story. That's, uh, that's the Western movie, in a way. That's The Searchers. Um, the movie The Searchers. The movie yes, The Searchers. Recently. Yeah, uh, that's James Fenimore Cooper. Uh, that's uh, Buffalo Bill. In a curious way, you can even take it to outer space. But uh, How so? Uh, well, the space, the final frontier. Uh, Star Trek was originally going to be called Wagon Train to the Star. <laughs> you mentioned Buffalo Bill. Didn't Buffalo Bill say the rifle is an aid to civilization? Yes, but that's, that's exactly the American myth. The Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett's rifle, killing the bears, killing the game, killing the Indians, is what makes the, uh, makes the wilderness safe for democracy, if I can paraphrase Woodrow Wilson. And Samuel Colt, who gave us his famous or infamous pistol, there are many versions of a quote either by or about him. Something like, God created men equal, Colonel Colt made them equal. There's even one that goes, Abe Lincoln may have freed all men, but Sam Colt made them equal. On and on these yes. variations go. What do you make of that idea? Well, uh, that's uh, the, the Colt, the equalizer, uh, was the nickname for the, the Colt revolving pistol. I realize that. It, yeah, it's, uh, um, and uh, it's a curious, uh, it's a, it's, it represents a kind of shift, if, if I may, the, 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 the mythologized weapon, the rifle, is a hunter's weapon. Uh, and uh, it's also a soldier's weapon, a uh, plainsman's weapon, but also a, a soldier's weapon. The Colt pistol uh, is a man killer. It's a, a weapon that's used as much in, within the boundaries of society as on the borders of society. And Colt, one of Colt's original marketing ploys was to market it to slave owners. Mm -hmm. Here you are, a lone white man, overseer or slave owner, surrounded by black people. Suppose your slaves should rise up against you. Well, if you've got a pair of Colt's pistols in your pocket, uh, you are equal to 12 slaves. And that's the equalizer, that it's not, um, it's not uh, all men are created equal by their nature. It's that, uh, is that I am more equal than others because I've got, I, I've got extra shots in my gun. But you write about something you call the equalizer fallacy. Yes. The equalizer doesn't produce equality. What it produces is privilege. If I have six shots in my gun and you've got one, I can outvote you <laughs> by five shots. Any man better armed than his neighbors is a majority of one. Uh, and that's the, that's the equalizer fallacy. It, it goes to this notion that the gun is the guarantor of our liberties. Um, we're, we're a nation of laws. That's, laws are the guarantors of our liberties. If your rights depend on your possession of a firearm, then your rights end when you meet somebody with more bullets or who's a better shot or who's meaner than you are. And yet the myth holds and stronger the, than the reality. Well, yes, the myth holds and it is stronger than the reality because the, those guns, particularly the, the, the Colt, is associated with one of the most active phases uh, and most interesting phases of, of expansion, and therefore it, it has the, the magic of a tool, the tool, the gun that won the West. Uh, the gun that equalized uh, uh, the whites and the Indians, the guns, that, the guns that created the American democracy and made equality possible. But there are other nations with a particular history different from ours that had been very violent. I mean, uh, Nazi Germany was no slacker, yeah. the Soviet Union. Europe, uh, all white countries contributed two wars within yes. 30 years of each other. Yeah. They have their own peculiar violent yes. tendency. Uh, the difference in American violence, um, two, two kinds of difference. One, uh, it's settler state violence. That is to say, it's legitimated when it's directed against Native Americans, Mexicans outside the boundaries of society or against an enslaved class within it. Eliminate slavery and you start to make problems there. We're a colonial society in which we've incorporated elements that the Europeans never really in incorporated. And the second element is this democratic individualism that we grant the license to kill to individuals in a way that Europeans don't. 
Uh, their violence predominantly, their mass violence especially, is social, police state violence, um, uh, uh, class, uh, class warfare of, vi of a violent uh, kind. For, for us, the murder rate, individual violence. 30,000 people killed every yes. year by gun yeah. violence. And I would take it back uh, even further than that to uh, the period between the Civil War and the 1930s when you had, a, as partly as a result of the Civil War, a, a society awash in handguns, uh, war surplus uh, handguns. Very few law, no national regulation of, of, of most things, uh, of, uh, essentially a sort of a right-wing Republican dream of the unregulated society. And what you got was social warfare waged by indivi gr individuals and groups of individuals. KKK. Uh, KKK, um, sure. but, but uh, in the South, that is, that is on, on the racial boundary in the South, KKK, White Citizens Council, Knights of the White Camellia against blacks, against their uh, white allies in the Republican Party. Um, in the North, you have uh, labor wars mm. in which uh, armed strikers are opposed by private, so-called private armies of detectives. We later call them goon squads, but they were called detectives then, uh, armed to, to, to shoot the workers. Homestead, 18... Ho Homestead. Uh, Ludlow Massacre out in Colorado. Right. So you have a period in the United States, as I say, from Brad 1865 to 1930, of extreme social violence um, in which America, a lot of Americans are armed. The European visitors all remark on the prevalence of pistols, and Sears manufactures a whole line of, of men's pants with a, with a pistol pocket. What about the argument? We increasingly hear that we need to have more guns because of a threatening government. To me, that's the most nonsensical thing I've ever heard in my life. First of all, the government isn't the black helicopter government that they have in mind. But if it were, your guns wouldn't do you a bit of good. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's an idea that began with the big lie about uh, the reason that Hitler took over in Germany was because uh, he disarmed, uh, he disarmed his, his enemies. The communists were not disarmed. Uh, they were outgunned. Uh, and uh, they didn't have the army on their side. It was one, in that panel discussion I was in, somebody... Was, after Newtown. After Newtown. Uh, one of the spokesmen spoke about the... the, 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 the uh, uh, oh, if the, the, the Poles had had more uh, widely distributed the guns, the Germans would never have invaded. Yeah. Right. You know, a, a bunch of farmers with shotguns standing up to the Wehrmacht. Uh, the Japanese didn't invade California because they knew Americans were all heavily armed and that the Japanese never intended to invade California, had nothing to, to do with it. it. It's a pernicious lie. And uh, the reason it's so pernicious is that it legitimates the idea that you have a right to violently resist the government. Most people won't do that. Uh, most people, when uh, the cops come to the door, <laughs> will put their hands up if it, if it, if it comes to that. But there are people, uh, uh, the, uh, some of these tax-resistant, violent tax-resistant movements, who, who take that uh, position very literally. We continue to hear from a lot of people, notably Wayne LaPierre of the National Rifle Association. Here's what he said right after Newtown. The only way, the only way to stop a monster from killing our kids is to be personally involved and invested in a plan of absolute protection. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So what kind of society do we get? What kind of social order do we get if everyone is armed? Uh, to me, we get a very dangerous, uh, or, or if, if we're talking about the United States, it's extremely dangerous because um, there are, um, uh, there are so many things about which Americans feel violently. Um, uh, the country is still very much divided by race. Um, the, uh, uh, the anger that one hears uh, in, uh, about uh, things like uh, Obamacare, 
the rage that's, that's expressed, the, the level of political rage, makes me feel that, the, um, uh, that there's anger out there looking for an object and that, uh, that the, more, uh, the more heavily armed we are and the more permissive we are about the use of uh, guns, the more dangerous it's going to be. I hear you talking about race and wonder, wonder how that has shaped the pattern that produces more outrage over mass killings like this one, and there should be outrage, than over the slow but steady accretion of one-on-one -on -one killings in in, in the inner cities. I mean, over 106 kids yeah. were killed last year in Chicago alone. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't regard as outrageous in the same way the daily killings in the ghettos, in, in, the, in the black neighborhoods that we, uh, that we do when it's, you know, little white kids in a little white, uh, in a little white suburb. Uh, there, there's also a difference, though, in that one is a kind of uh, aberrant outburst of violence in a part of the society that feels immune to violence. Whereas we've allowed violence in our cities to become a kind of normative pattern. Uh, and actually, I shouldn't say we've, we've let it. It's always been that way. It goes back uh, as far as our cities go, that they've been, always been violent places. Mm -hmm. And the culture has taken a kind of dismissive attitude towards it. Um, How so? Why? Uh, historically, uh, hi historically, I think it has to do with uh, the way in which um, members of racial and ethnic minorities are not considered to be fully human. So we expect them to be uh, to behave violently to each other, and a threat we don't, to jobs, a threat to, to, to right. our own standard of life, and standard of living. That's right. The Irish were, kept, were were seen as a threat to the well-being of the Protestants. Who right. Here. Now the blacks in the cities were a threat when they were rioting in the in the uh, in the 60s, a threat to white neighborhoods, uh, and uh, you got gun control then, attempts at violence control as well as as well as uh, measures of social welfare taken in order to avert that threat. But black on black violence in uh, in isolated uh, in, in urban neighborhoods leaves white America untouched in in both the literal and the figurative. Uh, figurative sense, even though that is the largest share of, uh, of, the, of the killings that go on. Well, we've talked about video games, but what about movies? Here's a group we put together. If we find that entertaining, are we in a societal way uh, condoning or, 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 or validating violence? It has to, I think it has to do with proportion. Um, there's so much violence and it's so inescapable. Uh, if you look at the, if you sort of did a genre map of the different types of films that are now available, so many of them are violent action movies that um, if you're taking your repertoire of responses to the world from the art that you, that you uh, consume, uh, violence is, is uh, the right response in, let's say, eight, eight, cases, uh, eight cases out of 10. That's the first thing. The, the second thing is that um, aside from just the sheer level of raw violence that one sees, the question I would ask is what kind of rationale are, are movies, now television and vid programs and video games, what kind of rationale for violence are these stories uh, providing? Uh, the old Western movies provide a very important rationale, and that was the, the, the principle that no moral, social, political problem can be resolved in a Western without violence. Anyone in the Western who thinks you can get away without a gunfight is wrong. Uh, and there, it isn't so much the, the, cru the, the, the spectacular quality of the violence, because by modern standards, it's pretty tame. But it's that, uh, it's that insistent rationale, the only way to resolve the situation is violence. And anyone who thinks differently just doesn't understand the way that the world works. I have actually wrestled for some 20 years with something you wrote in Gunfighter Nation. You said that central to the myth, the myth of America, the myth of how we came to be, 
is the belief that violence is an essential and necessary part of the process yes. through which American society was established and through which its democratic values are defended and enforced. Yes. So we invoke violence because we think it not only saves us but nurtures us and that we have yes. some kind of obligation and, and to that, use it in the service of spreading democratic values. Yes, and, and it's, it, it, it's, it validates our beliefs. It validates our, our, the values, the things we stand for if we're willing to fight for them. Nothing validates them like combat, fighting for them. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, in the frontier myth is the, the oldest myth. We have a couple of others that, that work um, uh, with, with similar kind of power. Uh, one of the, the ones that I was thinking of when I wrote that was what I call the good war myth or the, the, the platoon movie myth. And that's the, comes, it's the newest of our myths. It comes really out of the Second World War in which the United States, which had been always a white man's republic, an Anglo-Saxon white man's republic, becomes through the platoon movie, that ethnic, ethnically and racially mixed unit, uh, now becomes a, a, a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, united how? Through war against a common enemy. A good war, a justifiable war, a necessary war, a defensive war, a war that liberates Asia and, and Europe uh, through the force of American arms so that our self-transformation into all men are created equal, finally, uh, whatever their color or creed or national origin, is achieved through war, and only through war. As you know so well, President Theodore Roosevelt, back at the turn of the 20th century, wrote that, quote, mighty civilized races which have not lost the fighting instinct are gradually bringing peace into the red wastes where the barbarian peoples of the world hold sway. Yeah, he also said that uh, a savage war, a war against savages, is always a righteous war. And uh, it was certainly the, 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 what, what Roosevelt was doing there was taking the American past of Indian fighting and of conquering the West by, by driving the Indians out and expanding it to an international stage. So this idea of the frontier continues to, uh, to summon us to... Uh... Yeah, it, it does, although not often in as literal a way as, as, as Teddy Roosevelt would have, would have had it. Uh, two analogies, uh, or two, sort of two examples occur. One is, um, why is it that uh, for, for liberals, I'm thinking about it, Obama uh, particularly, the war in Afghanistan was a war of necessity, whereas the war in Iraq was a war of choice. They're both wars of choice. But the war in Afghanistan has all of the hallmarks of savage war, a primitive enemy, uh, bent on our destruction, can't make a deal with them, uh, 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 can't liberate them, can only destroy them. I'm thinking about the Taliban, and I'm thinking right. about the, the, the Al-Qaeda uh, yeah. people there. Bin Laden hiding Bin Laden, out, yeah. there, operating that, from there. That's a, right, that's a righteous war. Whereas Iraq, Iraq was supposed to be World War II. It was supposed to be a war of liberation, but it wasn't. And it soon became obvious <laughs> that it wasn't that. And so you've got a kind of public revulsion against that among some liberals who supported it initially, but not against, not, a, not until recently anyway, not against, not against Afghanistan. And the second, the second piece of that is the, economic, is the economic piece of that, which is that the American economy is an economy which perpetually expands without costing anybody anything. Without, without cost to a lower, without exploiting a lower class. For the past 30 years, it's been perfectly obvious that that's not working anymore. Mm -hmm. The rich get richer, the working class gets poorer. Um, uh, and yet we still, we, we still hold to that. Why don't we believe, why don't we believe in, in, uh, in global warming and the consequences of that? Why don't we believe uh, uh, that, I, because nature is inexhaustible has to be inexhaustible. If nature is not inexhaustible, infinitely exploitable, then the American system will, st will stop working. Let's not even say whether it used to work or it will stop working, it will fail. And we can't, we can't afford to believe that. So we create myths 
that help us organize our beliefs against the reality that's right. that we cannot factually deny. That's right. That's right. So, so what is implicit in this notion of regeneration through violence? I think it's, for, for, the, for today, it's still our belief in uh, the, uh, the validity of violence as a way of dealing with the complex problems that as a nation, as a society, even as, as people that, that, uh, that we face. Uh, we still trust uh, to military action excessively in dealing with foreign affairs. And we still, it, it's still a kind of predominant mode uh, we'll cut foreign aid of all kinds, but we won't cut, uh, or not cut as much, military, uh, uh, military budgets. We'll develop new ways of using force to intervene in foreign affairs, covert uh, ops, special operations. But, uh, b but force still has that, that uh, critical, uh, critical role for it. It's, just, it's almost like they're, it's, not, not necessarily the first resort, but sure as hell is not the last resort right. for us. I sometimes wonder if Charlton Heston will have the last word on this argument. Here is Heston speaking in the year 2000 at the annual convention of the National Rifle Association. Their nemesis at the time was Al Gore running for president as a Democratic candidate, whom they said uh, would take away their guns. So as uh, we set out this year to defeat the divisive forces that would take freedom away. I want to say those fighting words for everyone within the sound of my voice to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. <laughs> From my cold, dead hands. What do you think listening to that? Uh, I, I think the man's an idiot. Uh, if, um, if the government <laughs> was actually the kind of government he somehow fantasizes, uh, they would take the gun from his cold, dead hands. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful line in, in uh, the first Men in Black where the space alien comes and the, wants, the, wants the, the farmer's weapon and the farmer says, for my cold, dead hands, and the alien says, your negotiation is accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, that kind of defiance is cheap uh, because um, uh, it, it, it threatens a resistance that would be illegitimate if it was undertaken and that no one in their right mind would actually undertake. But mythologically, what does it represent? Well, it's an, it's an assertion that, that you're Davy Crockett, that you're, uh, well, I guess it's, in his case, it could be an assertion that you're either um, uh, oh, one of the revolutionaries at Bunker Hill defying the British. From the age of the weapon he was carrying, I would assume he was defying the British. Um, or it could be Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy uh, and this notion that if you, don't like the way the, if you don't like the outcome of the election, go start your own country. Uh, take up arms against the government and uh, somehow that's a legitimate and constitutional action. It isn't. It's unconstitutional. And if you do it, the government will come and take the gun from your cold, dead hands. What a conflicted country this is. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, it's, but, but think, of the, think of the resentment and the fear that would lead to that kind of, that kind of posturing on a public stage. That's the, that's the uh, to me, that's the menace of our time, is that, that undercurrent of resentment and fear and hatred that uh, finds an outlet, outlet in the legitimated forms of, of violence. Including the killing of 26 people, 20 of them children in yeah. Newtown, Connecticut. Yeah. Richard Slotkin, thank you very much for being with me. You're very welcome.